Serious TV Drama Podcast. I'm Scott, and joining me this week... Well, wait, it looks like i got to throw out my original intro here. Oh, God damn it, I can salvage part of it. Forget my B-roll bro thing, for it's not him. Oh, but you know what? She can be the nester to my Choi Flores. Here she is, taking time in between tribal councils to return for the first time in, in más de tres meses. It's Jamie. Hey, Jamie, welcome back. Stop laughing. Hey, thanks for <laughs> thanks for having me back over. I appreciate it. We're gonna have fun talking about this one. Yeah, we are here now. Let me make sure anyone who wasn't aware of the announcement I put on Facebook, which is probably most of the people listening, because I didn't I didn't tweet it. Sorry. Um, we are here to discuss two HBO series. Unfortunately, neither of those two are going to be Succession. Um, Brian is unable to record this week. Jamie here. She's only recently started watching the series, and I felt Succession deserves more than just me talking about it. Yes, I just said that out loud. So, (laughs) I've... No, but there are some things I could do a solo podcast about Succession. I think you need at least two people talking about it. So, I've put my notes back on the shelf, and next week, Brian should be returning. I spoke to him earlier. It sounds like he will be. And he and I will do a double dip of those two succession episodes, you know, (laughs) in succession. See, get it? Anyway. All right. (laughs) But I feel now that Jamie is back. And Jamie, I think this is the first time you've been back in three months. Was the last time you were on the was yeah. the, best, the best of, I think, right? I think it was the best of. Yep. Yep. We had our New Year's special. You bet. There you go. Well, I think between having Jamie back, we've got more than enough for uh, a fairly amazing podcast here because we've got the season finale of Perry Mason. And I'm going to keep saying season finale until we hear definitively that the series is not returning for a third season, which is my fear. But you never know, especially with all the fun stuff happening at HBO, Discovery, Max, wherever the hell they call themselves now. We will also have the latest episode of Barry, you know, the one that aired right after this week's succession. Now, right now would probably be the time I would be kicking things off, you know, with the Perry Mason conversation. However, one thing I need to mention that I forgot to mention last week. I don't need to mention it, but I'm going to mention it. We recorded, Brian and I recorded last week, I believe we recorded the night of April 20th. April 20th, I believe, was actually the ninth anniversary of the podcast. I think the very first podcast we released under the series TV drama podcast umbrella, uh, whatever we call it, banner umbrella, that makes no sense, was April 20th of 2014. Uh, me, and a, me, and this, me and this young lad named Dan <laughs> you know, decided we were going to try to talk about Mad Men and without knowing anything about, you know, audio... <laughs> <laughs> recording. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's like, wait, maybe we can use coconut shells. I don't know. Uh, apparently that was how, how, how my, my acoustic sounded like in those days. So I did, I did want to, I mean, obviously it's the ninth anniversary. That's not as big a deal as 10. I don't know if we'll make it to a 10, but I've been saying that every year for how many years now? So <laughs> we'll see. Um, however, since we're not talking about succession, I thought maybe I might give a minute or two for, I'll I'll say like a quickie take on a few other series. I'm going to try to stay somewhat spoiler free. So that way, none of y'all out there, you don't need to skip to another segment. You can stick, you can stay with us here. For example, in the last few weeks, a couple female led dramatic series made their debut. One of them, Mrs. Davis on Peacock. You know, the the streamer that I, I bought for a week for a Yankee game like a year and a half ago or whenever it was, and I forgot I still had it. And like, oh, look at that. now And now there's occasional like movies and shows on it I watch. It's great. Except they try to make it, they try to force you to watch like 18 other things after it. Anyway, Mrs. Davis, the show is co-created and occasionally written by some guy named Damon Lindelof. I, I'm assuming a few of you might be familiar with him. You know, you probably 
think more highly of him than I do, but he is a guy who was one of the main Lost dudes and Watchmen and whatever. It stars one of my own personal faves, Betty Gilpin. I love Betty Gilpin. And what I'd say, what I've seen so far, it's got a very similar vibe to Preacher, only with a far more fun and engaging lead than that series ever had. I've heard that it shares maybe just a little DNA with a show called Warrior Nun. Just the title alone kind of tells me, oh, I can see why that, that would be the case. I've never actually seen that show, so I can't follow up on that comment. My only take on it is it's kind of crazy. It's kind of over the top. It's a show about a badass nun fighting against a world-dominating AI, and she's got this mission to find the Holy Grail. But if that's your description, the show should be kind of crazy and over the top, and I really like it so far. Have you checked it out yet, as a, Jamie, or do you not have the? Or maybe I don't know if you have Peacock, so I shouldn't. I shouldn't. Hi, I do not watch the Yankees, and therefore had no push to get the <laughs> Peacock last year. But I'm going to tell you what I have seen in uh, teaser trailers uh, and word on the intranet. I may end up having to get it because the show looks like it's kind of right up my alley. It is up your alley from the show that you've talked to me about in the past. Also, I can't believe I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention the show on the podcast, but I'm almost shocked you haven't gotten into the Peacock because of that stupid Trader show. <laughs> it's so up your alley yeah. because it features people from all the different reality shows that you're a fan of uh, and the ones even, even, even ones that I know, like, like that show called like that Survivor thing or that Big Brother thing. They play huge yeah. parts in the scene. I mean, Siri. Siri is the reason, and not 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 the one that's going to probably you know turn on a light for me in a day in, in, in a minute because I said that. <laughs> anyway, then there's another series uh, that just premiered recently on Netflix called The Diplomat, and we are reminded of how great Kerry Russell was on The Americans, and she's from what I've seen so far. Again, I haven't seen that much of it, but I have seen enough to know. She's just as good as she was there, except now she's got a bit more of a sense of humor. Um, her character wasn't known for being very funny on The Americans all those years. And this series, it's got a very clear West Wing kind of vibe to it, but with considerably more tension baked into the series, which which makes it work because The West Wing was really more an ensemble series. You know, we would be following multiple, multiple storylines and characters week after week. And this is a show that's really the focus is more honed in on Kerry Russell's character um, from scene to scene and episode to episode. Um, just to give a you know, the, the log liney synopsis. She's basically a newly appointed ambassador to the UK who doesn't actually know she's being groomed for a much higher office within the administration. Um, there's actually a lot more to it than that, but I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to spoil that much about it for anyone else. Plus I've only seen one episode. So <laughs> have, have you, have, have, have you heard about that show yet? I have heard about it. It is on my queue, but I have been uh, inundating myself with Brett Goldstein Productions and have yet to move into anything Carrie Russell. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, you, you know, I am I am almost tempted just to go well, you know, just go off on a tangent and, and talk about certain shows that Miss Miss um, Brett is involved in, but but I'm going to stick with the female thing because I am going to mention that show now that I know you do watch. I didn't watch today's episode, however. Because there is one other female-led series that has come back recently, but this isn't a new one. It's one. It's it's in its final season. It's a comedy that has it shares dramatic moments. Who knows? It's the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, the name I love to mispronounce. Did I get it right this time? It is Maisel, right? <laughs> you did it. You nailed it. Hey, as I said, I think when we, when we talked about it on a podcast many years ago, and if I didn't say it, I should have. You're talking about someone who went out with who went out with a girl for five years whose last name. And I still forget. Wait, was it Levy or Levy? Or it wasn't Levi. I know that Levy Levy. <laughs> oh my God! I still don't know. And I'm I'm like really close friends. Wow, that's that's kind of embarrassing. Good thing she's never listened to my podcast. All right, but my best friends have, so they'll they're they're gonna they're gonna scold me. I'm sure. I'm I'm, I'm I'm not I'm not smart. I'm not I'm I'm not smart. Hey, it's not as bad as there's. There, I can name at least. Well, the problem is I can't name them. At least four people I, I went out with at a certain point in my life, and I have no recollection what their name is. So I can't even look up them on Facebook to see what they look like now. Kills me. So Mrs. Maisel, 
<laughs> which I know, Jamie, I know you want to twist my arm to actually do a full fledged po- podcast on it before it's over. I think we will. The way the season's been going, I feel, hey, I feel like we, we will. started the series with one. We got to end the series with a goodbye. I'm all I'll say about it. Cause again, I'm, I want to try to be spoiler free on this one. Um, I'm in, in my opinion, the show is kind of is off to its strongest start since its first season. The way I'm looking at it right now. Yes. I'm especially amused. Oh, this is how I'll, I'll say it. I'm especially amused at how I think they've kind of, um, shall I say, they've refurbished the structure and concept of the old Dick Van Dyke show for the main plot line, which I adore that they've done that. And I and, I, and I'm being an old school TV guy myself. I actually get every single reference they've made to you know, everything from the, your show of shows and the people on that and everything else. I'm really enjoying that. I also like the flash. They, they, they have incorporated uh, the opening of each episode with, with a form of a flash forward. I, I mean, there may be people who don't like that. I do actually. The reason why I do, and again, I'm not, I don't want to get into the content of the flash forwards because, you know, again, that would be super spoilery. Mrs. Maisel is not the kind of series I was wondering as I watch it. Ooh, is she going to die at the end of it? <laughs> or something along those lines. <laughs> the way we did with everything from... I mean, it, that wasn't just a Sopranos Breaking Bad thing. Come on. Some of us thought that about Mad Men, too. There was idiots who thought, hey, that guy falling in the credits, I think that's Don Draper, so he's going to fall out a window at the end of the, at the, end of the series. And it's like, really? They're going to end the series on a suicide? Shut up, you idiots. But back to Mrs. Maisel... I'm sorry. Is there anyone watching the series for the last, you know, four seasons that doesn't think she's actually going to quote unquote make it? I, I, I've never had that impression. I've never thought that. I don't think anyone. Right? Thought, I don't think anyone thinks. You know what? She's eventually going to give up trying to be a comedian. Stop it. Stop it. You all. We, so so if you have flash forwards that indicate she was a success, <laughs> she's going to be. Yeah. <laughs> completely comfortable and content getting married, popping out two more children and being a stay at home wife. Yeah, it's fine. It's, it's going to be like, I gave it a shot. Oh, well, wow. What a, what a great idea for a TV series. <laughs> you know, it's like, Hey, failure. <laughs> awesome. But I, I, what I do like about it, but there is still, um, with those flash forwards and again, not getting into the content of them. I like that. There's a, there's that more than a twinge of a tragic nature to it. Which I've already re- referred to the show in a totally different way. It, I like at the end of it all. It kind of has a, almost a weird Mad Menish quality to it as well, because at the end of the day, if you even think about how Mad Men ended, and one could say, "Oh, it was kind of a fun ending," so it's like, yeah. But if you really think about it hard, there's something kind of tragic about all of it. But it's you know, it, it's not I'm going to cry myself to sleep tragic, but it's still kind of oh, he's still. Kind of not a great person. Okay. Tragedy of the human condition. There. Oh, see, dude, this is why we bring Jamie back. You know, I mean, Brian Schmrian, who cares? Anyway, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, I'm like, without getting into anything more specific, I'm almost surprised by how much I am enjoying it so far. Um, I mean, the, the, the things that I've had issues with in previous seasons, which is basic, and let's be honest, it's really me saying, wow, it, I feel like Tony Shalhoub is wasted season after season on this show. Um, that's not any different now, because it, there is a, a certain one-note nature to some of the things he does on the show. But I'm like, you know what? I'm okay with it at this point. It is what it is. I just think he was better. He was better when he was still a teacher. Ever since he stopped teaching... I think he just became a less interesting character to me. And that's all I'll say about that. Jamie, you could, <laughs> you could, have, said, you, you could have said something. I don't mind. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say this. If you haven't watched this show yet, you really should watch this show. Because, sure, it's a comedy. At the end of the day, it's a comedy. There's, there's some great funny moments in it. Uh, but it is darkly optimistic, and it is just beautiful to look at Uh, Mm. just set design and uh wardrobe alone is is worth the watch so uh stop wasting the time watching whatever slubby show you watch it and uh (laughs) go go check out miss mazel i feel like they've even up their game with um the set design and the art direction this season i really i'm I'm very i'm very much walked in and said uh 
we're going to razzle them. You know, we're going to razzle and dazzle. And they, they, they have. Yeah, it's gorgeous. I, I, I think they've done it. Um, you know what? I'm, I've just, since you brought it up, I'm going to give myself a minute on it. You mentioned Brett Goldstein. So obviously you're referring to both Ted Lasso and um, Shrinking, right? Yes. So Shrinking finished. I really like Shrinking a lot. I I, I really in- um Is Jason Siegel maybe the the least interesting character in some ways on it? Yeah, that's not a shock though. That's not a shock because I yeah. feel that's the case with a lot of show, a lot of comedies over the last twenty five years that we all like. And it's like, hey, you know what's kind of funny about that show? The main character is the least interesting character at times, you know, or it can be the most like, oh, okay, can we move on to the other ones? Just yeah, like, yeah, like they're they're almost like the tour guide to the real attraction, right? You know, I mean, I'll you know, no one was watching How I Met Your Mother because of Ted. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Okay, Fun, cause, and that's a show that Jason Siegel was on, and he was, I really liked him on that show. Again, it's not that I don't yes. like him on the show. And in fact, he has a lot of really good, genuine moments, especially the stuff with his daughter, I find very oddly believable on the show. Um, mm-hmm. Harrison Ford is going to get an Emmy nomination. I think I would be so shocked if he doesn't. I will, you know, I'll, I'll bet money with anybody that yes. he does. I'm not saying he's going to win. Could be because it'll probably be some oddly enough, it'll probably be some probably Brett Goldstein wins, but you know, for Ted Lasso. But um, uh, Jessica Williams is a revelation on the show. I think she's yes. dynamite. I think she. I mean, Love I thought I, it's like it's interesting when you have a scene between her and Harrison Ford because I'm like, wait, I can't figure out who's stealing the scene because I think it's her, yeah. and then I think it's him. And it's like, I think I, I think they kind of one-up each other, and it's the weirdest chemistry I've ever seen on any TV show in recent memory, because those are two I never would have put together in a scene, and yet they it works really nicely. I really do like a lot about it. Um, I, I, I enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to a second season of it and seeing where they go with it. It does have that feeling of, you know, obviously when you've got, you know, you know Brett Goldstein from Ted Lasso. And Bill Lawrence is behind this show, too, isn't he? Because so, it's got a very mm-hmm. – well, first of all, I think Bill Lawrence's wife is in it, and I don't know what she did to her face still. But um, <laughs> it's got that feel to it, certainly. Um, so I have enjoyed it. Ted Lasso this season – um, <sighs> there are things I really like about it. I still like the show. It, I, okay. Number one, I don't know if the episodes need to be an hour long. That seems a little weird to me, but you know what? If I love it, I'm okay. I don't care. I don't love it. Yeah. I and like I, it. I don't and I love gotta it. Say, it- the amps, the hour in Amsterdam, totally worth every minute. Yes, I agree. I, I thought the Amsterdam stuff. I, I, I love the little, all the little storylines and where it went. They're all in their own neat little packages. I, I was all on board for that. I love the mystery of what happened. Although I'm going to say right now, dear, dear Lawrence Goldstein and 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 and, and partners, <laughs> you know, at Ted La- at the Ted Lasso Productions. I might be in the minority. Don't know. Please don't give me an episode later in the season where, hey, let's find out what the coach did all all, all night. And I, I got a weird feeling they could do that. I hope they don't do that. I don't need it. I, I don't, I don't, I just, I don't need it. I like the mystery of it. I like him showing up with the David Bowie outfit and everything. Like, I don't, I don't need a story. But I keep thinking, I, but I, I thought for a moment because it, based on that episode that we, they did with him before, which I yes. actually like that episode. I'm not, I'm not one of the people who didn't like that episode, but I don't need to go there again. I don't need to have another episode like that because then it makes that episode not feel as unique and and, and interesting if you're going to do something like that every season. So please don't do that again. I'm going to guess just from your reaction, we probably have, are are we in sync on what the, uh, what the issue is or maybe not? Well, maybe we're not. I should not assume with you because you often uh, go on a different uh, path than I do. (laughs) Yes. I know when my, I I do. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll make it simple. Because I'll, I'll make a uh, process of elimination. I actually have no issue with Ted and his storyline and what he's going through. I, I always find, you know, and I think Jason Zedekis is still some of his best work. And the actual football team storyline with, you know, with Richmond and everything that's going on and, and the Zava stuff and all that. No problem with that whatsoever. 
but there's two storylines I do have a pro I do have some level of problems with. One I feel is just wasted and feels somewhat disconnected from everything. And the other one I I don't I don't I don't I'm not I think it's been a problem from day one and it just feels like more of a problem the last two seasons than before. The first one is um what's her name? Keely? Keely? That's that's the first yeah. one. Cause I really, I'm gonna I, agree with you on that one. I really like her. I like that character. I like, but it mm-hmm. it, it mm-hmm. seems like she's so disconnected from everything else. It's like yes. it's like I'm watching Ted Lasso, and now we're gonna take a side trip to this other less the interesting spin off. Ted Lasso spin off, right? <laughs> yes. Which which is an office populated by by non entities and an annoying HR person, um, and and then all of a sudden. Look, I don't. I don't care about the whole storyline with. Oh, now she's hooking up with her boss, Jack. Yep. Which it, yep. it's not. It's more the fact it's your boss seems a little weird. And like, okay, are we gonna get into because that that be- becomes a sticky. Hey, when in the UK? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I guess. I, yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I don't. Ca- I, I. I don't care about the 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 gender aspect of it at this day and age. Who, who the hell cares anymore? Um. But I just feel it's kind of wasted, and and I've just been more intrigued. I was intrigued by the whole b- breaking up of her and um, and Roy, and the fact that mm-hmm. it seems like these two broke up, and neither one of them really wanted to break up, and that's what. But it, they still did it anyway. And then and then Jamie's mm-hmm. kind of like, and Jamie's become such a better person that maybe he's become the person that she she always wanted him to be. And I thought there, were, so I thought all that was going on, but. But instead, she, and I and I I love watching her become herself and an independent person, whatever. But it doesn't feel like it's in, enough in service of the fucking series. It doesn't feel I like would it's, agree. it doesn't feel like it's connected enough to what I'm watching the show for. And it feels like they okay, we we, we almost felt like we were writing the character out, but we don't want to write her out, so we'll just follow her here. Nope. But it's like it just feels like it's. The fact that we finally got to see Keely and Rebecca together just this week mm-hmm. um, really pointed out to me right. how how little she is involved with the, the rest of the uh, cast and the story that we've gotten this season. Uh, so it is really disjointed. Right. I, I like I like her character. I'm, I like seeing her go out and achieve all these things. But you're right. It's like watching a different show for 20 minutes of each episode. Right, right. And that's why... Maybe that's one of the reasons these episodes have been like an hour long instead of a more normal comedic length. The other issue, it's the Nate issue for me. Uh, Hey, at least he's not spitting in mirrors anymore. My God. (laughs) Yeah, but it, 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 it (laughs) it feels like they've kind of been adrift with that character. Once they decided, okay, we're going to do this heel turn with him. And we've, and you know, and, and you should have seen this coming because, you know, the way he was mistreated. And then there was that episode where he kind of rips into everybody, blah, blah, blah. It's like, oh, we're, we're building it here. Okay, sure. sure. I, of, of course, sure. you could have had those, that, that season and not have that. And we, none of us watching would have been like, hey, I'm surprised they didn't do a heel turn with Nate. They, I thought that none of us thought that. I'm sorry. We didn't. It's one of those we look back and realize, oh, okay. But it kind of went really kind of weirdly. I don't know if dark is the right word because, quite frankly, I wouldn't mind dark sometimes. I just felt like it, it felt a bit much, especially his anti Ted mm-hmm. stuff. Um, mm-hmm. But and now it's like, wait, are there, are we trying to now they're trying to swerve back in a way where it's almost like a lurching swerve to a certain degree, and the whole thing with him tr- always trying to um, with, with the hostess at the restaurant. And I guess f- finally, the last episode, because I haven't seen this week's episode, um, but I know previous to that, though, he had, he went on that ill-fated date with the uh, the vapid model there, and it seemed like she almost, <laughs> was the first time she kind of like, I don't know if she was taking pity on him or saw him as a human, like, I don't know what it was. It's like, oh, wait, is that where the storyline's going? Am I supposed to be rooting for you? It's, I, I don't understand. I it, it just, it the whole thing just feels... The construction of it feels really weird to me, and I, I kind of I can kind of guess where they might go with it. I just don't know if it's it feels earned to me, 
because there's got to be. I feel like there's going to be a scene where he's going to repu- um, rebuke um, the owner of, of of the team, the guy, the Rupert. Yes. Yeah, I feel like they're building up. Yeah, to that. it 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 is it is disjointed in the sense that. Uh, uh, a, a common complaint that we've been having in Survivor Land is I need to know uh, what happened between point A and point seven uh, to know why we're all of a sudden we need to root for him now. Because like two episodes ago, he was still spitting in the mirror and uh, and, and talking crap at press conferences. So uh, it's like they try to rush that part of the storyline in where it seems like it'd be something that would have developed over an entire season and then coming back into a following season would have made much more sense. Yeah, absolutely agree. Well, I'm, I'm almost shocked that we're in sync on this, whatever. Otherwise, I mean, again... Is it still a good show? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is, it, is it a recommended show? Absolutely. Will it still probably win a bunch of awards? Yes. Hey, by the way, the Emmys are notorious for awarding shows and seasons, i.e., so best series, whether it be comedy or drama, in seasons where it was not the show's best season. <laughs> <laughs> Check all the Game of Thrones Emmys. Anyway. Yes, so, yes. Uh, I'm sorry. When they won their Emmys, for, the years they should have it's won, they didn't. It's and a tradition. It's a tradition at this point. Yeah. You see that? Or, or it has to be the final season. So, Okay. So that was my little – so did a little TV talk for some other stuff. So without, without succession, we, we brought in a whole bunch. It's going to be hell me trying to do the segment breakdown, but I'll figure it out. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so – Let's get to what I'll call our closing arguments for Perry Mason. Now, Jamie, as you know, you're going to have to step up and assume the the lawyerly position that Brian typically takes. So, good luck with that. So, you can yeah, look at- yeah. Listen, I I am no expert in law or court or uh, or anything that Brian usually tends to ha- ta- uh, bring but- to the table, which is why I uh, always say what Brian said. Um, but you're gonna, but I am a fan of the show, and I love good writing, and I love me some Matthew, so uh, I'm here for it. Well, I'm making you out to be basically the Della Street for us here, and you're going to be ta- oh, okay. taking over well, the reins for change, our, and, and Brian's our Kentucky. I need to change my tempo. Uh, I need to change how I deliver my lines and, then. And, and look, you're wearing, you're, you're, you're wearing an odd hat the way she always wears an odd hat. Um, I am. <laughs> So you it is think, a hat day. I was going to refer to Brian as our Kentucky Fried Perry, <laughs> <Whatever>. <laughs> which is interesting because you know we, yeah. we've we've heard the phrase Kentucky Fried on this podcast many times over the years, but usually not in reference to Brian. So there you go. So Jamie, yes. before we do crack open the finale, since you this is the first time you're on the podcast talking about Perry Mason, and again, you don't this doesn't need to be any form of a manifesto. It's just so it's just so both our listeners and even I can can see how you're tracking and, and thinking of the show. So I, I'll call, we're going to sidebar with you. Look at me. I'm, look, I'm pulling out all the legal phrases when Brian's not here. So what a waste. Thanks, Jamie. Anyway, I'm blaming you for not being, which makes no sense. You have nothing to do with that whatsoever. Okay. Um, That's all right. It's but like okay. I said, v- listeners already have a feel for how Brian and I have been w- viewing the show and whatever. Um, and I'm going to assume and, until you prove otherwise, <laughs> which is why, why would I say it that way, that you probably haven't listened to us. <laughs> Um, but I'm curious to see if you're, um, as I said before, uh, when we were talking about Ted Lasso, if you're in sync, or maybe you have a totally different perspective on the first several episodes of this season. You know, but you know, just looking for a big picture, broad strokes kind of view here. You know, if it pleases okay. the court. So, what, what, what's your if take? If it pleases been, the court, yeah. Exactly. What's your take been so far? Okay, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be real honest with you. First, first half of the season, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't grabbing me. It, it took me longer to watch this season. Um, I, if we hadn't spoke yesterday, I probably wouldn't have gotten to the finale, uh, the last two episodes, uh, for another couple of days because it it did. We were talking about tempo a moment ago. Um, the the tempo seemed really off to me, especially in the first three or four episodes. I just couldn't get uh, couldn't get the hits in the way the first season did. But something happened around episode six and it shifted and it started to feel a little bit more like home um mason started to feel a little bit more like himself and the story started coming together in a way that i was okay now i know what i want to root for <laughs> and and something about the way the dialogue shifted halfway through uh was also something i i have noted 
um, the the first half of the season was it's like they fell back and almost went into um, what would I say? Like they hit the you know obviously it's a noir, but it's like they almost overemphasized. Oh, by the way, you're watching noir. <laughs> um, the way that we had a lot of spaces in between sentences, and I don't know, just something was just too much or not enough. Huh. Uh, but like I said, episode six starts coming in, and then it was like, okay, okay, now I'm starting to get get to it. The last two episodes of this series, uh, spot on. I don't, I don't have complaints. Loved it. But the the first few, I just I could not get on board the way uh, I know some other people were. Interesting. Okay, so not in sync with me and Brian. Then excellent. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, I popped in. I popped in a little bit uh, on on some of your on some of your episodes, um, but it just I was feeling like oh god why am I not loving this because usually if there's something that you uh, and he both really are into odds are I am. Right. It's never really that much of a question. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I can't exactly say what it was, but I just did not love the first half. Hey, it happens, man. I'm not going to, I won't castigate you for it. Or, um, you, at least you finally came around towards the second half of the season. So I'll give you, I'll give you all, all the credit in the world for that. The, the irony is that I actually felt that, uh, the first half of the season got to a better and more satisfying start to me than the first half of the first season did, where yeah. I thought it was a bit more meandery um, and not really sure where they were going. And then, of course, back then it was like, wait a minute. Is Perry Mason ever going to be a goddamn lawyer on this fucking show? <laughs> or or the, like, when, when did Perry Mason become a P.I.? <laughs> you know, you know the fact that you know as much as you can yeah, get the origins, the origins, you know, right? You, 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 you give me, you give me Perry in a courtroom. That's all I need. That's all I need. And and now, 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 you, now you've given me Dell in a courtroom too, and she's had one of the great best scenes of the whole series. In the That's courtroom. great. You yes. Know. Um, and the whole weird culty religiony whatever thing in season one for me was kind of mm, the whole damn season. As much as I love Tashiana Maslany, whatever. I never loved that storyline. I always found it distracting was, uh, and somewhat confusing at times. That and, was a really odd time for TV too, because at the same time, uh, the 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 new Penny Dreadful was airing at the same time, and it had a very similar like thing happening with the church and like the the woman evangelical like it was it was strangely similar um all happening in la i don't know it was a bizarre thing right. that both of these shows were basically telling us the same story right 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 so what what i really am enjoy what have enjoyed about this season go, leading all the way up to the finale we're about to talk about in a second here is it's funny because you, you talked about how they're really we're leaning heavily into you know putting it in big, you know, bright neon letters on a, on a dark, <laughs> sultry night with a jazzy theme playing. This yes, is noir, yes. noir, noir. Okay. You know why I don't mind that? Because I'm not getting that anywhere else. And I'm not, I'm not seeing it in no, films. There you go. I'm not getting on TV. I love the genre. There, they, there, they, a lot you are of, correct. There, there are aspects of the show that they're, 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 you know, it's a little Chinatown light at times, which I don't mind because, you know, that's, you know, whatever. <laughs> but, but it's also about, because it's about much like Chinatown was, um, about the beginnings of, El of of what Los Angeles really was or, or was becoming, and th that's something yes. they're hitting here in a very interesting way. Um, but but I, hang on, very much enjoyed it. But we'll, we'll, let's get to the finale here. Um, there's a couple brief moments I'm probably going to skip entirely past that, that happened in the first act. You know, there's a scene with Camilla calling Phipps early on cares and or Paul Drake encountering the apparently not dead after all Ozzy Jackson. Interesting, but I just mentioned it now, so I'm not going to mention it later. So anyway. <laughs> anyway, the episode starts off with Camilla getting a spa treatment. And I love the fact that they do this in a very surreal cinematic way. And it also, in, in its odd way, it's also kind of setting her up as if she was almost like, like a monster from Kabuki theater or something. <laughs> But because it, it, it's it's interesting because there's something really kind of beautiful about it, but there's also something kind of sinister about it, which 
really works for her character and just the show in general. So I, I really like that kind of yes. opening to it. I, that wasn't how I was expecting the episode to open. I was like, all right, okay, I like that. But when we get to Perry, and uh, as you may or may not realize, if, if you listen to it a little bit, uh, we, we always like to look at how they get those opening title credits up and, you know, what's in front of them, what's behind them, how are they, you know, involved in the frame. And sometimes it's something minor, sometimes major. This one was great. Because, you know, Perry's front and center, and he's pacing in front of the letters of his name. It's really it's really kind of beautiful the way they put it together. And at this point, he's discussing Camilla with Della. She does not want to accept that Camilla could possibly be behind the murder. And it's around that point when Drake walks in with his still very shaken wife, Clara, and they relay what happened with uh, with with the uh, the hophead that they had pursued whatever and they find out about the Phipps connection and that clearly cinches the Camilla theory and you know and and you can see the disappointment in Della about the whole situation cuz she I you know she really wanted to be right about that for so many reasons here but also and 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 also in this moment we also find that's when she is feels forced to reveal and it's more because Perry keeps prodding her. And I get it. In the situation, I don't have a problem with what he did. If this, if this, if, if, if there weren't people's lives on the line, maybe I would say, no, she's, she doesn't, she can't talk about it. But the direness of the situation, yeah, you do have to kind of reveal it. You know, she, she, he pushes her enough to reveal the situation with Hamilton Berger and how he's being blackmailed. And he catches, mm -hmm. and it's unspoken until he says it. He catches on to what exactly it must yes. be that he's being blackmailed about. Love the reactions. Uh, it's great to see what his reaction is, and then to see what Drake's reaction is. Because that really, yes. I, I felt both were very true. It's like it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't fa it wouldn't phase him. It's gonna phase Drake a bit. Because it's just it's maybe simply because it's not something he would encounter as often as maybe Perry has or Perry's. But all this is also making me realize that because I had questioned several weeks ago on the podcast. Wait, does Perry know for sure about Della's situation over to, over the la last season or not? And then there was a scene we, when we got with like, oh, he cleared that now. But I wasn't sure about it, and I didn't want to go back and rewatch season one to see if there was a scene where it ever came up. So I know you wanted to say something here so I'll, I'll let you uh pipe in well i also find it interesting that well if we do uh get a following season if it does happen i i feel kind of what we saw how we saw drake taking that information is going to come into play mm -hmm. uh given the job opportunity he's received yes i think you're absolutely right about that that's a that's, that's a good that's a good call on your part Speaking of Mr. Berger, we do the next scene. We cut to him, and he's with, I, he's he's the guy who Milligan is every word that begins with the letter S M, except for maybe smart. But maybe he's not. No, I shouldn't say it. He's not stupid, but he's definitely smarmy, and he's definitely smug. And you can you can already you you know Berger's exasperation with his character just in this scene. Oh, and oh, by the way, I was. You know what? I know early in the season there was a shot or two I called and I got right. There's a few shots I tried to call for this finale. I was wrong. So let me let me make that clear right now. One of them was I actually thought Milligan might have had a hand in the whole blackmail situation. Um, he did pretty 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 clear he did not. <laughs> so let me just go on the record as going I'm an idiot. But uh, I I do love the moment where he finally uh, Burger asks, "How did you find out about the gun?" And, you know, so Milligan fills him in and what he, what he did. And the whole point is that that was a risky move. You know, you could have, you know, you could have yes. jeopardized the DA office. And then the way Milligan responds, like, yeah, but I didn't. There's kind of an indignant, you know, you, you know, it's the job, isn't it? It's like, mm. and what, what I, what I find interesting about that comment and Hamilton's, reaction to it his face and then if we when we fast forward to what what perry's closing statement is going to be about which brings us back to Berger as well and his own words from the very i guess it was the very first episode um if i'm not mistaken great scene in the first episode 
How could you not like that scene, Jamie? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I'm just fucking with you now. Um, but I thought, I thought that was just such an important line and reaction because I feel that plays a significant part in Berger's decisions for in, later in the episode and the way he, the way he goes along with certain things because of the belief of what, um, Milligan and that, and that's what others would think. Yeah. You know, he, this is what the job is supposed to be. It's a, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, whether you're being, you know, you're, you're, you're just a degree away from being corrupt. He's not quite corrupt, but he's like, mm, don't smell that good. You know what I mean? He's also, yeah. he's also a uh, jerk. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I, I agree with, with where you were going on that. And the, it's the overall theme, right? Is the the institution itself? The, does justice exist? Uh, what what's the institution you're dealing with? Is it the process? Is it the people? Like all of these questions that come in on this uh, this moral ambiguity, you know, uh, it's the job. It's right. the job you have to do with the job entails, and sometimes that means defending somebody who's guilty uh and sometimes that means pushing the limits to almost breaking the law to make sure that justice is served right um and and yeah. the, and the interesting thing actually when especially when we're looking at it in this episode and then you take into account what's happened in the previous seven whatever is i can't i can't i, I don't like using this word this phrase in this day and age because of how we've seen it used in the last uh six seven years <laughs> You probably know what I'm talking about when I say it, Jamie. Um, this is a kind of a both sides kind of a thing because of the things that Perry and, you know, along with Della and Drake have done this, se- this, this season. There are moral questions to be had about all of them. Ethical mm-hmm. questions, everything from, you know, whether it be the gun, whether it be the things that Drake did or had or felt or had to do, you know, like like the beating of Ozzy Jackson and, and, and things of that nature. Right. Um, th- th- there's there has been a significant amount of chicanery there as well, if I may use the words of a certain other lawyer from a certain other show that we've talked about in the past on this podcast. Which takes me to one of my favorite, 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 favorite scenes in the entire episode. Get back to the courthouse. We get this great little scene between the judge and Perry at the shoe sh- shine stand. It's one of my favorite scenes in the entire episode. And there's a little point in the conversation after, you know, bringing up the good earth book that, that the, the judge had been reading earlier in the season. There's this way that Perry toes the line by... He, he he points out on one hand he is his client's best option at this point as opposed to bringing in anyone else yeah. to defend them but he also very clearly acknowledges he does deserve to be punished as well so he's he's he, you know he, he he's not defending what he did but he's defending that he still needs to be the guy you know on the case i love the end where the judge said this one needs a little polish i was like oh, oh, oh thank, thank, <laughs> ooh. the guy in the writing room was like oh, I, I can get away with this can i yeah of course you can go ahead go ahead it's, it's good it's good it's good don't don't you, they didn't, you didn't play it too you know, they didn't play it too heavy <laughs> it's my the, one of the fun things about the se- the unexpected things about the season because you know we watch a season like this and you know you're you're, you're a Matthew Reese fan as am I whatever <laughs> loved loved his loved his two minutes in cro- <laughs> cocaine bear I just saw the other day um, and we have our opinions about you know you're you know either it be the, the actress playing Della or the person playing Drake whatever. The judge might be my favorite character of the season who isn't one of our main characters. I think he's just, I've loved him in every scene. And the thing that I've admired the most is that we've watched so many legal shows and, and things that involve judges, including this show, Lassie, whatever. And outside of maybe The Good Wife and The Good Fight, where they have fun with the judges on those shows, obviously, especially The Good Wife, whatever. They took the time to not fall into any of the cliches that you would expect the judge of a trial like this to be to the point where it's even mentioned in the episode. And it's almost like they're shocked that the judge is fair. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's like, and the judge is like, you know, that's kind of, 
<laughs> that's kind of like the thing we're supposed to be. He's just like, you, you ever right. see those scales, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just, I, I think he's, he's been my favorite character, really. I mean, I, I the only thing I regret right now is that I, I, I didn't look up the actor's name to get, to give the actor credit as well, but I really have enjoyed that this- character. This this guy is is great too because it's well well what you were talking about with with so many judges you see in in court shows where it's like they're either just always angry at the attorneys or they're just like there's no passion there and here is a character that you can see it's almost like. There, you can almost see a backstory with this guy where it's like he does have a passion for justice. He does believe in the right, dif- the difference between right and wrong, um, that he does support this system. He isn't corrupt. And it's it's fun because when, when they get called to the bench, it's like you can see he's, he's keeping his court in order. But there's like almost a little amusement when he watches these guys bat around their case because it's like, what? Okay. You know, like you can kind of see where it's like, he actually has genuine curiosity of, of how this is going to come together. Uh, And that's just not something we get a lot um, in, in a judge role in a, in a lot of these court shows. Well, a lot of times when you're doing a show of this nature um, or a movie that's along a similar line, especially when it's a period piece, particularly when it's a period piece, 30s, 40s, whatever, um, a lot of times it feels like the judge will be seen as an obstacle, and which yes. means the judge will have preconceived notions. And mm-hmm. much mm-hmm. like a lawyer having to win over a jury, we'll feel like we'll have to win over the judge as well, or whatever. We've seen, and, you know, it doesn't matter. You can go, you can, you can start listing everything you've ever seen, you know, oh, the untouchables, he was actually on the take, and all, but just, it, it goes on and on and yeah. on. Yeah. Um, I just like that, that wasn't the case here, especially considering, you know, the previous season, we saw quite a lot of corruption in, in, in the howl right. halls of justice, whatever. So I like that, that technically didn't play a part in the same way this season. Yes. What Milligan did was kind of, you know, mm, you know, not not great, but he uncovered something, which in one would say, well, that's kind of worse, (laughs) you know? And as he said, it's the job, isn't it? You know, burgers being forced to act in a certain way because he's being blackmailed, but, but Mm -hmm. he's not being blackmailed by someone else in, in, you know, in his capacity, it's you know it's someone in power who's trying to con- who's trying to manipulate and control the situation. So, right. um, so those two scenes I mentioned earlier that we're gonna, that I was going to skip, I think they were the f- next two scenes that followed that. So we skipped them already. We're going to go to the judges' chambers, <laughs> and we that's where we find that the trial will go on. After all, they're not going to there's not going to be a mistrial, and they also make it clear that once that trial has concluded. Perry Mason is going to be pleading guilty to essentially concealing evidence, and he's going to be spending uh, four months in a county lockup or wherever. The state is going to be allowed to call two additional witnesses, which will basically be all about the gun. And the judge makes it clear it would not be in Perry's best interest to cross-examine them. Because obviously, if you cross-examine them, hey, you know what's going to come up? where that gun was and what happened. <laughs> you probably don't want that out in court. So outside of the jail sentence, they actually, they actually, it actually works out pretty fair as well as it could for them as far as the trial is concerned, because if the jury hears that they were hiding that, then that's going to, you know, that's the only thing you're going to be focusing on. It's like, well, why would, why else would they hide that? You know? So, Della is a bit shocked that Perry accepted such a harsh sentence, but you know we we end that that scene with them as they're walking down the corridors. That he says it gives him time to try to get those pictures to remove the threat of blackmail that's hanging over Berger's head, and and you got to and one can't help but think in that moment. Obviously, that's ninety ninety five percent about you know making sure the right person somehow pays for the crime, and you know this right. is. Almost, but at least I, I like to think there's at least maybe five percent on Perry, maybe ten. Like wanting to help out Hamilton, because even though Hamilton is you know technically the adversary, 
they've had a and you know they, they've had a pretty good rapport and and even friend or or, or friendship even. Um, for the last two seasons, although that whole illusion of justice conversation in, in the first episode seemed to indicate otherwise the way Perry reacts, although we're going to see something different uh, just a little bit later in this episode. Yeah, and I think that there is probably a little backing in there to realizing how close he and Della are. Yeah. Um, it just a, a just a genuine respect for her and what she considers close and almost family, um, and and as we see towards the end of the episode, it's it's kind of just writing itself in the sand, right? Like that we've got to stay on the good side of this because this is going to come in and it it's, it's going to be something that being friends with him is going to help protect those he loves, not just himself, not just his clients. There's a bigger picture here, and. Perry Mason just has a res- has a an ounce of uh, of of respect for those who uh, have a have a position um, and and knows that you're going to be vulnerable if you have a position of power and this isn't he hasn't been using this necessarily abusively um, but he's in a position where at this day and age that kind of blackmail could undo him. Uh, and I think Mason's got a pretty good uh, peg on this guy that, you know what, maybe he maybe he can make the justice system better. Maybe he can stand behind what he's saying. Also, there's always the case of better, always better the devil you know than the devil you don't. And at Absolutely. How, how, you know, because as I as we said here on, I think, the, the first Perry Mason episode of the season, um, both the interesting thing between Perry and Hamilton Berger is they're both cynics, but they go <laughs> yeah. about it in a very different way and what, and, and how they've given into, given into it and how they view things as a result of it. And that illusion of justice conversation was pretty much mm-hmm. the epitome yeah. of that. You know, it's just Perry has grown depressed and frustrated by the situation and angry and lashes out. Um, whereas Hamilton has accepted it and has learned how to work within it yes, uh, and work the system. And even though it is always the system that's broken, no matter what year we're talking about. So let's get back to our trio as they go and they confront, they confront Fipsy. Now Fipsy, ah, poor Fipsy. He's resistant at first, but finally it seems like he's got <laughs> no other real option pretty much than to help them. Yeah. So I was like, he's oh, in a tight spot, Yeah, tight spot, tight spot there. So then afterwards, they, then um, they're off to visit the Gallardos in prison. And then we have this little moment where they ask if they, if um, Perry and Dell, if they know how to write a will. Now, we already know they've done stuff like this. That was what they were doing before they got yep. back into criminal law. But the tragic nature of it is more, it's not simply writing a will. They, they you know, especially, I think it's Raphael who brings up, they want to make sure that their bodies are brought back to their family after they're yeah. hung so they don't have to go and visit a mass grave. So, yeah, dark thoughts. Uh, so much for hope. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it is, is a really a, it's a, it's an upsetting meeting too because if you've ever been in a position where you've got somebody who uh, understands the situation you're in better than you do yourself, and you say, uh, "Hey, like." You know, maybe I'm not asking someone to, you know, help me write a will, but you say, hey, uh, can you help write a will? And they're not like, you don't need to worry about that right now. It's yes, we can. It, it's just that settling where everybody involved realizes how dire the situation is, what it could really mean and what they're actually facing. Uh, and just to watch everyone's shoulders fall, just these little ticks in the acting where the shoulders right. fall when the line's delivered. It's like you're watching like okay, you know, like what I was worried about it makes sense. It is true. We do need to write up a will. Right, right, <laughs> The professionals right. are saying, uh, yeah, we can help you with that. Yeah. And uh, I mean, and to use a phrase that I, I used, I think, 17 times in the previous podcast, at the end of the day, <laughs> at the end of the day, <laughs> As as we as we knew from the very first or or at least the second episode or or, or whatever or whichever episode it was where the, where the, the we cinched the, the situation with the gun actually, um, one of them shot that fired that gun and killed the guy. 
So someone's going to have to, no matter what, they're going to have to pay for that. So there was, there was never going to be a purely happy ending for these guys, no matter what, right. you know, this, so, right. you know, so th- speaking of things, they made a choice, a right. choice was made. Right. Now we do get this scene that happens with Drake where he encounters Perkins again. Um, and then we have this conversation between them where Perkins asserts that, you know, Drake kept his word that he kept out of sight during his trial um, because of the whole situation where he was, you know, he was the guy who was taking the pictures and what he saw and he didn't want to get, you know, avoid being getting involved in it and making and escalating, making things worse. He actually wants to hire him because he wants to continue to make improvements in the community, like by building a park, for example. But he needs to get like dirt on the local politicians who are likely to Mm -hmm. block it. So it's, it feels like it's going to be one of those. On one hand, you could say, oh, it's doing the wrong thing for the right reasons. However, I yes. would, I would, part of me pushes back on that only in this sense, in the first part of it. Cause Drake has essentially been working as an investigator, a PI. Mm-hmm. What he's asking him to do, that's what they do. That is literally what they yeah. do. They investigate people. You know, it's just like in politicians getting oppo research. It's the same thing. There's nothing, as long as you're not, if you're not committing a crime to do it, and there's no indication that he would be, then there's nothing wrong with what he did. I mean, it's just like what he did right. at the very beginning of the season where he got into the guy's office and, and took pictures at the supermarket, you know, might have been a little scary, but did he break in? I don't think he broke in, you know, that's how, at least that wasn't the indication. If I recall, he just kind of slipped in anyway. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was kind of like with Fipsies, you know, well, the door was open. You just walked in. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. It's, it's fine. So we um, we get back to court. We do get those witnesses establishing all, all the information about the gun, where it was found, that it was the murder weapon. Perry, Perry keeps his word, does not cross-examine. I did have a momentary thought. It's like, if he did, is, is, there, is there a route he can take where he would do that? That could, and I, I couldn't think of anything, and he did. It's like, okay, there isn't. I'm not crazy. I, th- I thought maybe he was going to ignore the judge's, you know, uh, uh, you know, words here and just go ahead and do it because he thought he had a, a path. There was no path. And just like that, also, I'm like, oh my god, we're we're closing statements already. Which I was like, we are. Okay, that seemed really quick. But okay, good it's, because it's an eight episode season, not thirteen or twenty two, whatever. You get Milligan's first, and let's face it as he has been since the very first time in front of reporters here in front of a jury, he once again is by today's standards, at the very least very offensive, incredibly offensive, at least by either today's standards or even civil human being standards. But that is how you're going to, that is how you'd be closing a case in the situation, especially in 1933, uh, when you the, the two people on trial are two, you know, Mexican immigrants and, you know, mm-hmm. a, a, yes. a, and a rich white dude was the one who was murdered. I mean, let's actually, the only thing that would have been worse if it had been, you know, if it had been a woman who was murdered, then they really would have ripped them apart. Now, Perry's clothes is very interesting. We already hinted at this before. He basically quotes Berger without saying his name. Because he's he brings up how someone had, had talked about and I think he resp- he refers to him in a in a very respectful manner, if I'm not mistaken. Uh maybe you jotted it down, I didn't. Um but he does refer to it's about the illusion of justice. And I love those who know me and know, uh, and also fellow podcasters like, like Kelly, I geek girl soup. We love when things come full circle. And I love the fact that in the closing statement, we are, we're, we're brought back to a conversation that, that closed the first episode. And it was probably the most memorable moment of that episode, quite frankly. The whole concept of the illusion of justice. And what's very interesting here, and it's my own, it, it, and honestly, it might be my only regret that Brian isn't here to talk about it because I would have liked to have gotten the lawyer's perspective on this, but you know, eh, too bad. The fact that he basically takes a, a much more philosophical angle about justice overall, and that is what his closing statement is. Very little of it has to do with the overall facts of the case and the situation and recounting this, that, or the other thing. Mainly because I think a lot at this point, it's not really in question anymore. I mean, yes, there was a lot of trying to obfuscate things with all the situations with Brooks and his personal life and and the horrible things that he Mm -hmm. did and whatever. But here we go. Second time I'll say the phrase, at the end of the day, (laughs) you know, these guys murdered him. You know, we don't know, you know, and... That's kind of that. Right. But it was an interesting 
way to go about it. Briefer also than I expected it to be. I think Perry's closing statement yeah. in season one was, was longer, if I recall. But again, it's because he can't take the tack of, of going through the case because that's kind of lost. You know, you can throw it, you can throw, you can only throw so much stuff at the wall about your whatever. But at, but at this point, one, that gun kind of just, you know, the, the, the fact that the gun was found at, at the hoop by the Hooverville, yeah, we, yeah, the, 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 there's, the, you don't, there's not that many dots that you need to connect to connect it to them at that right. point. So, I mean, it was. Well, and, and going forward, knowing there's going to be, you know, the confession of one. And, but you know what? Perry Mason would never be Perry Mason without some great closing. And this was fantastic because not just, you know, the full circle, because yeah, I'm with you. We love the full circle. Um, but just this this notion of at the end, he's accepted his responsibility. Uh, and I'd like to pull this in because it wasn't in the forefront of our storyline, but we got to see him a little bit as a father. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is, uh, it is something that he talked about, you know, that he, he, he knows what it is to be. He's not a great, he's not a great dad, but he would, he would do anything to save his kid. And this is kind of in that same moral realm of he'll take the hit. He'll, he'll spend, he'll sp- spend four months in jail. Uh, justice is still being served because a murderer is a murderer, but also there's an innocent person who is at the sideline of this, who has a future and is going to get the future because he's taking four months of his life and putting it on pause for something he did that goes against his set of rules that he's supposed to follow. But it means at the end of the day, when he's talking to his son going forward, he can say, I, I paid for what I did. I partook in justice. Justice was served to me. Right. Um, and I think that is what he means when he's talking about he would stand in front. You know, he would do anything to save his son. This is this is part of that. If you grew up and your father, who wasn't really very involved, was a, a crooked attorney, you know, um, dealt with criminals most of their life, it, it would be a hard place to be as a child to look up to your dad in a certain way if he did a bunch of shady things to get a bunch of shady people to walk. It would be hard to have that respect. And that would reflect back on you and who you become going forward. So I loved that they did bring that up a couple times, um, showing him later on when he puts the picture up in his jail cell. Um, having a relationship with somebody who knows his son. There's just, there's, it's never right in your face, but this idea that he's a dad is always playing around in the background. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the, it, 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 sometimes I worry that the, the, the son feels more like a plot construct than a, than a realized character on the show. Cause we seem to then, for, he seems to disappear and we kind of forget about him for several episodes, including this one. I was kind of weirded that, well, he's not going to say goodbye to his son before he goes to prison for four months, but then we have the photo at the end. Um, yes. A, a running, uh, uh, the thing with Perry, the, the series and, is that they are very good about having specific themes and running parallels throughout the storylines and their characters. And one that we see that um, happens in this episode, and we've been, you know, as they've been going, as they've been building to it, it's people, characters, taking responsibility, taking responsibility <laughs> for their choices their and the consequences of those choices. And when they've done things that maybe they weren't proud of, but they own up to them and they take responsibility for them. That's what Perry does here. Um, Drake situation, as, as far as what he did, as far as everything from the, the, the actual photo taking to the, the beating, whatever. Pete and how and how he felt he was kind of forced into his situation when he was working for the DA's office and how he tries to try to redeem himself and you know with Perry it's and and owning up to it as well is also he was taking responsibility 
so on, you know, so on and so forth. E- 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 even Berger's actions, although his hand was forced, is still kind of taking responsibility for it and doing the ultimately doing the quote unquote right thing, regardless of how the public might perceive it. So I think that's definitely been a, a thing. And, that, and and going to what you were saying about Perry and his kid, I mean, if there's one of the major lessons that I think a parent teaches their child, and then I'll get off this because you know, we've talked about it enough. It's teaching them to take responsibility. Responsibility. Mm-hmm. Yes. I, I remember that on my report card. Responsibility was one of the things, you, had, you know, either you, had, either you got a U or an S or the needs improvement or whatever. Okay. So back to the episode. We're at Camilla's and we see Phipps going into the safe for those negatives, you know, to get for, um, to get, to get Berger off. And, but then he encounters her, comes down the stairs and encounters her. Yes. And they have this conversation. And Ugh. it's the the and you realize that she has that habit where she speaks to people like she spoke to Dell at the end of a previous of an earlier episode. No matter who they are, even if she regards them as supposedly being close, she treats them like the help. And there's a certain yes, disre- she does. There's a disrespectful way about it, especially considering the way she talks about his situation and his wife, which she clearly knows all about. Um, because the wife is the, and I, I, it, it didn't click to me until it was this episode that his wife is the pianist that we saw, um, at right. the yes. before. I was like, oh, okay, now we see that connection. I wasn't sure about that before. I didn't, I didn't, I don't remember them saying that that was his wife in that earlier episode. I don't think they did, but if they did, I just missed it. Um, but I love that that conversation pretty much, like, yeah, I was gonna leave, but now I'm gonna go back up those <laughs> stairs. You know, like, yeah, and then what we see him doing is that he he actually hands over her entire cachet of blackmail material, which he pretty much seems to have photos. There's a lot of everybody. So she's she, you know yeah, there's a lot. She's got I mean she's got the 1930s photo mat on you know retainer somewhere because they're, they're taking pictures of everything. <laughs> and but then, I mean, think about the position that she's in and being a woman. I mean, like. You're going to have to claw your way to the top. It's 10 times harder in the position she's in. So, you know, what's one way to do it? Get dirt on everybody. I mean, she had, she is very, very, very successful. She's not like a little successful. Like, she's dealing with like other countries, like interests, successful internationally. Uh, yeah, she's going to have a lot of dirt. You're going to have to. Well, bear in mind also, um, because we talked about this on a previous one uh, episode as well. Um, thank, I love those little, when you watch them on the HBO Max, you sometimes, some episodes we get a little thing at the tail end where we get behind the scenes. And the fact that the show has multiple, not just one, multiple historians on staff where they, because a lot of these characters are actually loosely or somewhat based on mm-hmm. actual people, yes. including her, someone who actually was, wow, first her, her life started out as a, if I believe, a piano teacher. We see she's learning, teaching piano and then became basically an oil baroness. That's what she is. That's, that, you know, so I was like, oh, that's, yep. that's fat. Yep. And especially in someone like that. And then that, you know, especially in that era, that's kind of amazing. You know, I don't know if that, what that famous, or that woman, if she had a cachet of blackmail, I'm going to, I'm going to assume she didn't, <laughs> you know, but it works for this story. Um, I don't know. I loved it. I mean, I've, I've seen this kind of trope before. That, oh, I hate using the word trope. Ugh. I've seen that idea used before, but it, it made perfect sense. I, I really dug it. Obviously, they at the office they lay out all the photos and they start realizing, wow, they've they've been following all of us. Although part of me was like going, wow, a lot of these photos mean nothing. Oh look, they got a hey Perry, look, they got a picture of you and your kid riding a horse. God, that that says dun dun dun. dun. Oh, <laughs> no, no. But maybe but maybe he was cheating on him with the horse. No, anyway, <laughs> I kept thinking, you know why they put that there? Just so he has the photo at the end. That's why. That's the only thing. <laughs> just, just so we can pocket it. Yep. Yeah. So they eventually, they do go to, Della and Perry go to see Berger with the black, with, with, they've got the film, they got the negatives. And I think Berger's reaction goes kind of the way we thought it would. That he's going to be initially be kind of, 
I told you not to, not not to not to go, to leave this alone or whatever. Yeah. But you know, yeah. there's a relief there as well because they've they've done this whatever, and he eventually agrees that you know they'll drop he'll drop the charges on one of the brothers if the other one confesses, which makes perfect sense. Whatever. And my first thought when he said that's like, ooh, I bet Milligan's not gonna like that. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's a good thing Milligan wasn't the blackmailer, I guess. Anyway. Uh, and there's this great little moment that happens right after it. I really loved how they did this. Because there's a couple ways they could have done it. And I like what they chose. It's Berger. He's holding up the negative of, you know, him with the with the other fellow. In it, whatever. Yeah. And he's holding it up, you know, close to, you know, the, the light bulb of the lamp by his desk. And because of the proximity to the heat of the bulb, the negative starts to warp and, you know, and, you know, essentially melt, you know, I, I yep. love that that's how they chose to do that as opposed to, you know, the cl- the classic way is, you know, you know, flick your lighter, your zipper, whatever, and, and burn it, whatever. But making it like it's, it's a light, it's almost like the light, you know, the, the light of day kind of, you know, bur- burning this away. I, I really love the metaphor there. I, I, I the fact that it's a neg- there's so many little things at play there. There's so many ways to mm-hmm. interpret that. I really kind of, uh, you know, I'm, it's like, oh, I feel like a big film school geek right now. I'm really loving this. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> and he's also one of my favorite. It's also a, it's also a great payoff if you saw all of the uh, the labels when Tipsy was grabbing them with all of the caution to not expose directly to heat and light. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> all over the package. <laughs> like, okay, they meant it. Yes, all right. It really is dangerous. <laughs> oh, yeah. He could have hurt his fingertips. So after that, um, you know, they go see the guy orders with the offer, and, you know, we know how that goes. But then we let, let, let's scoot back to Hamilton's office and with Milligan. And as we thought, Milligan is not happy with this decision. Um, which I think is what gives us our if, – if, if that's our only satisfaction we get as far as yeah. Milligan getting smacked down at least a little bit. Because he basically – he's taking him off the case and kind of like smacks him down there just to, just to get lost or whatever. I mean, he didn't, yeah, I don't, I don't, you came in here thinking you were going to get a vacation out of this. Well, you were wrong. <laughs> right. And so when we get to the courtroom, Matteo pleads guilty in court. And that's when we actually see what happened. And it pretty much is what we thought, you know. And I, yeah. I, I like the idea that Raphael even was trying to get him not to do it, so it even makes more sense that he would be getting to mm-hmm. plead innocent, and, you know, have the charges dropped against him because he wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't the two of them approaching the car. So it wasn't like they were in sync, like they had both done it, you know. Because he, he he didn't have it. He was not like he was like he wasn't like in a getaway car waiting, you know, where he then he would be part of it. At least that's, that's the way I would view it. Again, lawyer, Mr. Lawyer isn't here tonight, so I can't, uh, can't uh, skip that. Well, I think also it gave the viewers the ability to see the two of them and actually gain a sense of justice themselves. Right. That just, um, that, that, yeah, the with, right, the with right how person. it paid out. That's true. That's very true. Very true. So, yeah. So he's sentenced. Raphael's freed. Then we go outside the courthouse, and you know it's people speaking to the media. First, you, first you got Berger talking to him as as he would, and then Perry and, and Della, and then and that's when you realize <laughs> that, that the pretense for that Della has to live with, it's now public and it's real. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and I, 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 oh, I, a special someone, huh? Yeah, looking for a husband. <laughs> mm. Gag. I'm <laughs> just like Ugh! the whole time yeah. watching that scene. Just, oh my god! We also, you know, just just a little ways away as Perry leaves it to her. Um, Perry has a l- little moment with Drake, and it sounds like this is going to be a parting of the ways between them. That he needs, to, he needs, to, he pretty much needs to do his own thing. And he's, you know, he probably still has issues with what happened because even though what Perry wasn't specifically to blame mm-hmm. for it. You know, he is part of it. You know, the whole Perry, Pete, et cetera, kind of a thing. And maybe he got in too deep. Yeah, and, and I, which which makes perfect sense for for, for these two. Um, 
do we if there's a third season do we think that's gonna last no they're, they're, they'll, they'll be right back together because you know hey dude there's there's like 50 there's like 50 100 different books that have you guys still together so uh, calm down anyway, <laughs> i mean granted granted you're not a black dude in those books either but you know anyway modern it's cool modern times later it's the last night of freedom for Perry. And I do like the idea that he's he's hanging out with Della here. You know, because at the end of the day, that oh, I said it again. See? Yeah. I told you. It's the phrase for this podcast. I'm going to rename the podcast. At the end of the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what's interesting, and it kind of goes to what we've been talking about throughout the entire podcast here. They're having, once again, they're having a discussion about real justice and the illusion of justice. And it's that it's at that point you start going over all the things that they have done, and yes. you know, let's just say somewhat shady at times. Put it that way, a little bit. And then I love the I don't know if it's an I guess it's an analogy of a kind I don't know um, when they bring up Sonny's melons you know from the, uh, the supermarket. Yep. And yep. I'll be honest, I don't remember if this actually was talked about in an episode and maybe it was i'm just i probably just don't remember because i it wasn't something i took a I, note on i don't remember it either i feel like i would have remembered that well so well you know you you were you were so down on the first four episodes so it doesn't anyway just kidding. i mean i would have remembered something about sean Aston being accused of you know filling melons with well, water i don't know I, I was like, <laughs> it seems like something that would stick <laughs> I was about to say, wow, is that how they did it back then? Because you know they they use like sil- <laughs> these like silicon gel and stuff now. He didn't have Patty Duke money yet, man. <laughs> and anyway, but what it comes down to, it's about this again. It's about the system, yeah, you know, which we all know, you know, because that's maybe one of the more obvious conceits of the whole justice thing. Yeah, yeah, we know. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's problematic. It always, ha- it was back then. It's even more so now. Yes. So. We, we we go from that night to the following morning, and then Perry, he goes to see, oh, look, it's Ginny. He goes to see Ginny at the stables. And I like that he brings up what was one of my favorite quotes of the entire season when he, he asks her, when he's about to leave, that thing that he that she had said about Los Angeles, about when you're seeing things, you know, not as they were, but what they can be. And he hopes that she'll see him that way. I love the scene. Be in, well, I shouldn't say. No, I, I really like the scene because it's an apology without ever him saying sorry. Because I think it, it almost it goes without it almost goes without saying because what you did was bad. It was re, it was yeah. not good. And, Jerk move, man. And for and the fact that she it, it's apparent at the end of their conversation. That she is willing to forgive you, that she understands the, you know, you can make all the excuses we want here, the pressure he was under and, and, you know, what, it, at that point in time, it might have been seemingly the only logical conclusion, although I don't know if that's true. But, um, but she'll, yeah, hey, it's four months, not four years. Uh, I, I could see you waiting four months. Four years? No, no way. Yeah. Right, right. Those, those, those are prime years, man. I was just going to be, it's just going to be autumn after all. <laughs> exactly. They, they could take a, they could take that trip they were talking about. Della, Shout out to Yosemite. Yeah, Yosemite. <laughs> Sounds like they have a friend of ours uh, tra- travel plans. <laughs> anyway, the Della. <laughs> who, could, who could I be talking about? No. Anyway. Former co-host. Anyway, so Della <laughs> goes to see Camilla poolside. Oh, I I don't know why, but I really love that shot of like Della walking alongside the pool while she's swimming, and the and the water is just so crazy blue. It's just mm-hmm. there's something just mm-hmm. really beautiful about it. I keep the, I kept thinking, oh wow, is the black hole sun video going to start now or something? <laughs> <laughs> the color is just so amped yeah. Up. I can I can see the comparison. Yes. <laughs> But, you know, Camilla emerges from the pool and they have a, they have a little confrontation because, you know, Dell is basically saying, you know, I, I see you for what you are now, essentially is what she's saying. And, and Camilla is like, oh, I'm not quoting her because I don't have anything else in front of me. She's basically like, oh, you, you know, bless your heart, you poor deluded thing. You, you don't realize this is, this is yes. life, man, whatever. And I yep. like, I like the way they, I didn't at the moment, and then I, st- I I remember pausing it. Then I then I rewound that for a second. And I went back. 
I like the way they kind of weirdly soft pedal the fact that at this coincidentally, at the same moment, the FBI shows up and, and they're all, all the agents are streaming down the lawn towards her. And she's like, oh, you know, come in. Uh, you know, so she's offering him beverages, whatever, thinking she can just get away with whatever because she's obviously had her operatives in, you know, with the feds before, which we saw mm-hmm. with the whole uh, agriculture office thing. Um, but I think the assumption is here, no, you're not going to get away with this. This is this is just telling the viewer, like, no, 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 she'll 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 pay she'll she'll pay the price. Burger is going to come after her, you know, the, or or the feds are actually. So it's so it won't be him. So she can't use the even put out the rumor about his situation since she doesn't have the photos to back up yet. I don't think she's she, she I don't think she knows that that safe is empty as of yet either. So. No, I I would agree that she doesn't. I thought we were going to get one scene where she opens a safe and it's empty and her her look or something. I'm surprised we didn't get that. But we didn't really need it, so it's fine. We- I really, really loved this scene uh, for Hope Davis. Uh, well, we had a big, long tangent about this before we actually started recording. I won't get into that. Uh, but there, this is a fun – it's a fun scene because sort of like we were talking about the scene previous where he was able to very softly say what needed to be said without actually issuing an apology. In this, she's able to – I feel like she's able to tell Della, I see you, and I know who you are, and you need to stop pretending like the world's going to allow it. You've got to do what you need to do in order to be yourself and do what you want to with life. Because something that we saw with Camilla is that she was always saying, oh, and she she followed it up in this too, where it's like, well, I took care of the bad man. Like, is that a crime? Because I stopped other crimes from happening? It's the old Batman thing, right? Like, mm-hmm. who who's the criminal here? Um, but just that, that look that she gives her like, oh, honey, no. <laughs> like, but enough playing games. Let's be real. We both know who you are. Um, it was it was a really fun way for her character to kind of uh, end scene. Absolutely agreed. And we both like Hope Davis much more in this series than we did on that Showtime series. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> By a lot. By a uh, lot, yes. We get Perry walking. He, he's basically his, his his last few moments of freedom as he's walking up the stairs before he's about to be incarcerated. He's and he's with he's with Pete, who knows a little something about being you know <laughs> being taken into custody apparently as well. I love that talking about having skills while you're in jail, and apparently that Pete's skill was sewing. Yes. Sewing. <laughs> Which I did not see coming. <laughs> that wasn't. I love that it's such a like a gentle, you know, a gentle craft. <laughs> and I love the idea that Perry initially is an idea is like, well, you know, he's a lawyer, so he'll be lawyering, and, and he's like, no, 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 you don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, you know, you'll have every hard luck case knocking on your cell door. That's you know, that's what got you in there in the first place. You know, I like that he hands him, you know. The remainder of a pack doesn't give, couldn't give him a new pack. He gives him like a pack that's got like yeah, come six on, cigarettes man. in it, whatever. And then he asks him for gum instead to go along. And I keep to, oh, I'll be honest. That was the one thing that made me go. Dun, 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 dun. It's 1930s. Don't 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 start like oh oh now and, no, and by the time season three comes like yet. he's he's not gonna <laughs> he's not gonna be a smoker. Work because people don't like smoking because it's eat. Stop it! Stop yeah. it! Stop yeah, it! Yeah, we're not smoke. We're not quitting smoking yet in the 1930s. The doctors are still recommending it as a way to soothe your sore throat. Yeah. They, they didn't make. They didn't have anyone quitting Mad Men. They better not have anyone quitting Perry Mason either. It's one of the things I like about. The also, show. I mean, I've had Beachman gum. It's yeah. it's not the cat's meow. It ain't no Just ju- saying. It ain't no juicy fruit. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I'm looking at my notes. I actually wrote the word "oi." <laughs> I, I did. I did. I did like Perry's last words and see around fucko, which I like. Really yeah, that was that. fantastic. Oh, you don't hear fucko too often. I like that one. Then we get a little montage as we close the episode. 
And just to catch us up on other, uh, on all the other little story threads as we see Perry going through the process of, of being imprisoned, which, so, you know, everything from his mugshots being taken to him being, having to change his clothes and getting dressed up in convict gear and eventually being led past all the other convicts to his cell. So that's interspersed with all these other little moments, which are, we see Holcomb on his casino boat. And look, he's got one more arson to commit. You know? So I was like, okay, that 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 that's going to wrap up the casino boat situation. Okay. I love that we see Lydell in Japan, and then he basically find, gets out of Telegram, but essentially tells him, yeah, you're going to have to stay there indefinitely. Just, and, just stay there. I mean, you might have a rough couple of years moving forward, but... Yeah, we'll see. It's like you know, just stay there. Give it a few more years, and you know, then it'll be a lot of fun there. You know, <laughs> I like the idea. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, do you think it's gonna get hot? Do you think? Do you think Lydell was living in Hiroshima at any point? Um, we do. Ooh, we do that, get. Yep. We do get a scene where we see uh, Hamilton, Della, and Anita are all together out on the town. At least, or you know. And, you know, and he was working on a new movie. I love the, I could introduce you to Cary Grant, even though I do yes. insist that, like, you know, yes. Ca- Cary was by leave, leave the man alone. Anyway, but I love the, it's the picture of the happy couple moment. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 I like that they couldn't, now they could have had Anita have kind of a strict, a kind of a, uh, kind of a face and they didn't. And I like that they did yes. because Anita yep. is in the business of pretense and Hollywood and putting on a show. Mm-hmm. She should have, this is what, this is the stock and trade. She even brought up Cary Grant, you know, who, you know, basically as, as, as information right. has had it over the years, um, swung both ways. Um, so I, I did kind of find, find that, dynamic kind of interesting. It's like, okay, that's interesting. Um, we also see things like, you know, Paul gets a call from Perk from Perkins office. So he, you know, he start starting his little missions there and we see Raphael Gallardo, he's painting and we can see his talent there, but we, we eventually, uh, we, we do make our way back to Perry in his cell. And he's got that photo that you referred to before. And he's like, Oh, is that what he wanted a gum for? <laughs> 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 that was it. That was wow, he, he planned ahead. You know, like they, I'm like they didn't have <laughs> they didn't have stick them back in the. So he sti- <laughs> he he sticks that picture up on his cell of you know of, of the son that he, he he couldn't be bothered to say goodbye to that morning apparently. Um, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't resist. But I do like the the fact I, that I feel like mom came and got that kid out of the clutches of the man who couldn't ever be home months months ago. <laughs> well, yes, you know, you know, months ago. You think that at least you would have given him given him the train kit, you know? Um, but I love that we have the shot of the camera pulling back, and you know, with Perry in the cell, and I was like, wow. What is it this see? What is it this this year where I keep seeing watching shows with with lawyers ending up in prison at the end of, <laughs> at the end of the season, right? <laughs> Whatever. And then the thing that happens, which is more important than anything in the entire episode, in the entire season, <laughs> because I've been harping on it. I stopped for an episode or two. Yes, they brought back the goddamn classic TV theme at the end of the episode. Finally, yay! Thank goodness. Dear. I'm gonna give you a little, give you a little rundown. This lady do not like the saxophone. I am so glad to hear me some Perry Mason theme. I'm glad to say, dear, dear, dear HBO, if you bring it back, this should be the music at the end of every episode. Yes, not the last, just the last one, because the whole, the whole warbly sad little sad. Did, yep. I'll tell you something I'm humming it in my head right now I'm gonna t- I'm, I'm gonna Why, this, I'm, this was a given I'm gonna tell you something I'm gonna tell you something now which is gonna it's gonna be funny for for when we talk about one more show before we end the night here I watch everything with the subtitles on I just I do you know how the subtitles refers to the jazz music that's playing in part of the episode I, I'm not lying. If anyone thinks I'm making this up, put on the episode, put on the subtitles. Plotting jazzy theme. Last I checked, 
I can't I can't think of when plotting is ever used as a positive adjective. <laughs> Especially in terms of describing a musical piece, unless it's being deliberately done that way. I don't think they were. De- so I'm thinking whoever does the sub, whoever does, it's like, I don't like this either. Pl- tap, 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 plotting. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Overdone. That's better. <laughs> See, that, that that would be the one noiry kind of thing I would agree with you on. I kept thinking, hey, you want to be cool? Go watch an old episode of the Peter Gunn show, which had awesome music throughout every episode. You know, give me some. That would be amazing. No, we get. Awesome. Might be my least favorite thing about the show is sometimes I think uh, what you just said. I, so, wow. So, so we end by being in sync on something after all. And right now. All right. We, and we can only hope that they do come back for a third season. I, I, I'll be honest. I'd be shocked. Just because of all the weird, first of all, this show does not look cheap to make, um, and all the weirdness that's going on with HBO and their whole situation. I, I hope it does. I, I, you know, because I love the time period. I want more lawyering. You know, I, I that's probably my only other thing I want more of. I, I, I need. I just I need more Perry in the yeah. courtroom. I do because at the end of the, there we go again. At the end of the day, it's <laughs> Perry Mason. <laughs> It's Perry yes. Mason. I don't care if it's a new version of Perry Mason. That's fine. You can update and change all the things you want as long as you have one thing, one conceit. Perry Mason is a lawyer. He does lawyering shit. That's what we, that's what, that's what I'm paying to see here. And we got some of it. And hey, you want to make Della do stuff in court too? I'm fine with that. Her scene in court was amazing. Let them both. They could be. It's like Nelson and Murdoch if you're a friend of that stupid daredevil crap. But <laughs> that's a shot just at a friend of ours. But um, but I, I I need more Perry in court. That's what I need. That's what I need. You know, put put put. You know, let Drake do more of the PI stuff. I need Perry in court. All right. So I think it was a good finale. I think it was a good season. So. That's that's my wrap up on that. TikTok. I concur. Okay. So we've got a little bit of time. Not as much as I thought we would, but that's that's okay, because I talked a lot about other TV shows in the beginning. I don't know how to, I'm not I'm not sure I'm gonna describe that on the segment of break, then I'll figure that out later. But let's <laughs> at least spend a little bit of time talking about the latest episode of Barry, which was titled You're Charming. And it's a weird thing with Barry, by the way, if anyone pays attention to this sort of thing all for most of their seasons, they go back and forth with how they decide they're going to title episodes. Like if you go to cha- the season one, the episodes begin are chapters. It's chapter one, chapter two. Yes. And then yep. they abandon that. They, they do things where sometimes the, the, the titles are written all in lowercase. Like it's like E. Cummings is writing the script here or something. And then sometimes they're not. This season, it's gone back and forth. So, like, like when I put up a thread for it on Facebook, I wrote "You're Charming," you know, the way you think it would be written, you know, capital Y, capital C. Then, sometime later, I notice, oh, it's lowercase. It's a lowercase. You know what? I don't care. <laughs> so, screw you, Bill Hader. I don't like. I don't care. Okay. So, the, the, there's a bunch of fun things that happen in this episode. Can I just go right to the first fun one right off the bat? And Do it. kudos to them. And if the character was mentioned by name in a previous episode, I don't recall it. I don't care if he was or not. I love, I, I hope that he was, but even if he wasn't, I don't care. Them, Hank and, um, was it Christabel? Is that his name? When they get, when they first meet El Toro, and it's Guillermo del Toro. That's crazy <laughs> that they got <laughs> Guillermo del Toro to do this. I love that scene, the conversation, and let me bring it up now. My own, the my, one of my only regrets of you know Brian not being here is because they referred to the people that they're hiring to be the killers of Barry are actually two guys who host a podcast. And they talk about, no, no, don't worry. They record on Thursday nights. I was like going, hey, until this week, we always record on Thursday night. <laughs> it's us. And I was going to, the introduction is going to be, we were going to be those two guys. And, and he couldn't do it this week. So anyway. But I love this. I, I thought the scene was really funny. Um, it, it, it's just, 
you know, there, I mean, there's so many fun things to go. I mean, if, if you if you want to pick something to to a thread to go after, and you know, I'll, I'll follow your lead on this for for a moment. Let's go back and forth on it. You know, I'm very. I'll say this about the show, however, and then I'll and maybe that'll give you the impetus of where you want to go with it. Um, it's possibly one of the most risk taking shows I can think of in recent years. Uh, I always, you know, and the shows that I've liked the most tend to be that way. Sometimes they're obvious that they're taking risks. Sometimes they're not. Um, our usual example is always, you know, the obvious one is always Breaking Bad. Um, obviously, this is a quote-unquote comedy, mm-hmm. although it's a comedy with a hell of a lot of drama on it, whatever. Um, but they take a lot of chances on the show as they've gotten increasingly both darker and even surreal at times on this show. And I know there's always a concern with some, with, you can have a significant segment of the viewing audience. And I don't mean to be, I hope I don't come off being snobby at all here, eh, but I don't really care if I do. You have people who worry about, wait, wait, who, who, who am I supposed to root for? I don't, I don't know. And I said, no, no, that's the point. That's the challenge. That was the challenge of Breaking Bad. And even though it's a far different show, that's the challenge of this show. Because at, from season to season, we've seen how, how more off kilter and how damaged a person Barry is. And yes. you can have sympathy for him at times. Oh, by the way, here's the phrase again. I'm going to use it deliberately. But at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> You know, he he's not, it's not just that he's a, you know, killer, but his way of viewing things is really kind of so fucked up and skewed to the point where it's like, oh, you're, you're so damaged, dude. I don't, I don't know, man. But now this season, Gene, who I think we did have a considerable amount of sympathy for and were worried about from what was going on. I kind of feel like a lot of that's gone away. So it makes that yeah. story. So I, I kind of like the fact that, and then, and then Sally, I don't even know what to say about it. We'll have fun talking about <laughs> Sally, surely, you know, but you see what I'm saying? They, like they've taken a chance by take, cause I would say like, those are your, I mean, and maybe Fuchs to a, to a lesser and Hank to a lesser degree. But I really think, Barry, Gene, and Sally are really the three more focal points. I mean, I guess you could say Hank is to a certain degree, but you know, it's because he, I guess. yeah, I'm gonna say if I had to root for anyone at this point in the game, if, if if I was going to root for anyone, it would it would be Hank w- without even hesitation. It would be Hank. Uh, <laughs> like, I, I just. He's the guy that it's like in every everybody's got their, you know, their issues and whatever. But like to me, like where he stands, it's like he has more reason than anybody else. Like he's just trying to get shit settled down so he can, you know, have a nice life. Like even his lover is like more obsessed about becoming rich and dealing, you know, uh, black market sand uh, than even he is. And he wanted to still see Barry in like a good light. It wasn't until this episode where it started to dawn on him, like, no, you're abusive. Hank, so yeah, you would I, be Hank for me. Hank, Hank is is possibly compared, especially compared to the other three. Although, uh, maybe I guess one could make the case about Barry to a certain degree. Hank is probably the purest of them, as far as his nature, as far as how he has been from season to season. He's evolved to a certain degree as far as uh, being in touch with who he is as a person and his relationships, whatever. Whereas I think um, the others have taken a somewhat darker path. You know, I don't want, I don't don't want, I don't want to say they've devolved, but they've not. Is Gene a better, is Gene a better person now than he was in season one? Well, they've done this really, uh, uh, this wonderful, um, this this wonderful like character type of of an actor right we've got three people yes one of them is an assassin but we have three people at their core that just like they have a passion for acting and they're kind of awful people 
But then you've got somebody who is like an actually active criminal who kind of is less atrocious than the actors. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So I, I love that the show is always poking fun on how awful actors are. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, right. at, at this, and at the same time as making fun of themselves, you've got Bill Hader like doing scene after scene in the last three episodes where he's on a phone. So he's acting with himself into the camera. And it's just astounding how freaking good he is. Um. And then you turn around and can just like hate his character, but still just be like, God damn, that was so good. This guy from Saturday Night Live, you know, is just Jesus. He's got so much talent. Yeah, he's he's doing the De Niro thing with the phone because that's whenever I see characters talking on the phone and playing out scenes. Um, I've seen that's something I've seen De Niro do in several movies and some, you know, we and even the smashing the phone is like, oh, he's. He's doing good, fellas. Okay. Well done, Bill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jimmy. Jimmy's a little pissed. <laughs> um, so it, so it, it just it, – it's a uh, it's a huge risk they take because, you know, there's certain moments with all these characters that are somewhat off-putting and, you know, and also we want to almost distance ourselves from them as characters because they're, mm-hmm. they're something somewhat un- – because in- including – because the show is Barry. So – yeah. At the end of the day, we're probably we feel like we're supposed to root for, <laughs> for you know when all this is ha- look. Is there anyone watching who isn't at, the, at least somewhere? And maybe you haven't thought about it until I mentioned saying it right now. Don't you kind of want to see it at some point later this season where there's kind of some sort of showdown between Barry and Jim Moss? I think so. Because yeah. Jim Moss has been the only other character who's shown himself to be like, oh man, <laughs> this dude. <laughs> Holy crap! He he scared he scared the crap out of this guy so bad he's talk he's speaking German now, which which I'm gonna, I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to figure that one out. That's so that's so brilliant. I, I was like when they when they came up with that idea, like, but that doesn't you know what I love that it doesn't make any sense <laughs> because that's what. Yeah, but that's one of the amazing things about the show is sometimes they just like you said they take some really outlandish risks, but it just seems to pay off in the right way. It, it, it has, you know, it's a show that can have moments of horror and moments of pure ridiculousness, you know, then you throw in some surrealness here, some really fu- silly, funny stuff here. Oh, and let's great. Let's, let's make sure we do amazingly cinematic angles and then shots and like, wow, you're, you're a cinematographer. If he, he bet, he better be loading up the chase scenes the in orchard. history, throw it in there. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Or just it's like okay, we don't we don't need to recount the entire scene, but we're going to watch the car and like, oh, so that car is going to crash into something any moment. Ah, oh, there it is. <laughs> right. And I mean, I know this isn't this isn't about this episode. I think it was the second one in on the season, but I feel like it is. I have to do my my due diligence here, as as uh, Sally is from hails from. Uh, the same town that I currently reside in. Um, we did, we did get a few uh, Joplin moments. Uh, I'm going to tell you, there was nothing ever said that anything was filmed here, um, but that airport convincingly Joplin's airport. So they did a great job on that. Also, I love that the mom dropped that she was going to go have her hair done at North Park Mall because I might have a part-time job within that building somewhere. <laughs> I might know where she got her hair done. Oh, that's too funny. <laughs> that's crazy. Um, it was it was pretty it was pretty humorous. I mean, also like, ugh, yeah, I live here. <laughs> uh, yep. <laughs> But that was, it was fun. It was fun to get to see that. But uh, speaking of Sally, the, the whole scene where she's coaching, teaching, mm-hmm. um, you know, she's she's using the method that taught her. Right. Uh, what did you what did you think about? I I would argue that was one of her best scenes. Quite honestly, I I really loved it. Um, it's funny. Do you do you think she was like? 
when she was using the method and she was belittling her, do you feel like she was kind of almost attacking herself? Yes, of course. Like she was mocking her younger self. Yeah, she's 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 basically reenacting what she went through with Jean. And so and she was viewing this woman as her. I mean, I yeah. love that she kept referring to her um her 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 perfect chest, I'll put it that way. And I kept going is it really? Yeah, it's yeah. Either, I'm, I mean, speaking, speaking, speaking. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest. I, 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 cause I can talk this way. I'm, cause you know, my podcast. Um, you know, I've got an eye. For, at the end of the day. At the end of the day, I do have an eye for certain things, and I was like, <laughs> they're, they're okay. I don't. There's not. There's nothing that outstanding about them that I can see. Whatever. They're, they're <laughs> adequate, they're, right? I don't. I don't they're, they. they they, you know, they might just be bees, quite frankly. Anyway, I mean, um, are they are they fight are they fight worthy? Maybe, maybe no, not. Perhaps no, not. No, or they're not even flight worthy. Um, <laughs> you know, but she's not wearing. But, I kept saying, but she, she's also wearing kind of a sweatery top. You can't really. T- anyway, I I was confused by that focus. She there. reminded me a lot of uh, like Daryl Hannah. She had a Daryl Hannah thing about her. All right, I can see that. I can see that. Yeah. Um. Yeah, the acting class scene. Um, it, it 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 was great for Sally because Sally has been the character I kind of go back and I've gone back and forth on all for all four seasons. Absolutely. I mean, there is some. There's sometimes I think she's a great character, and I think she adds so much to the show. And every once in a while, there'll be a time mm-hmm. where like. Uh, I, you know, we can just skip Sally this episode, and I'll be okay with that. You know, uh, it really. And yep. I think. I think for her, it also depends on, and and I guess this could be said of a lot of characters, but not all. For me, it, it, and, and I mean no disrespect to the actress at all, it really depends on who she's playing off of, and that's. And I think you know if she's playing off the right other characters then I love the scenes and otherwise, and then I'm like, eh, I don't know how much. I... And maybe the scenes between, uh, here's the weird thing. Maybe I don't love the scenes between her and Barry. That for me, I don't, I don't hate them, but they're not my favorite. Whereas when she right. would interact with say one of the other, the, the woman who was one of the other students who we also knew from like the good place, the one that she's yelling yep. at in the elevator. Yep. Yes. I love their interactions. I thought their scene back and forth were always really great. I loved all her stuff with her, her with her agent and all that stuff, and uh, I, I thought that I was actually really into. Um, the acting class, it's and obviously it's prompted by Jean telling her, you know, you got to teach because um, you know mm-hmm. it's follow what he. It, it, Those who cannot do teach <laughs> exactly, um, and I also like the fact that it was she does essentially she does what Jean had done. But this audience is saying, like, no, that was really mean and abusive. That was, you know, and they basically all walk out, whereas nobody left when Gene did it. And you go, it's interesting because you can get into the whole gender politics of it, even though the bulk of that audience of the, the students were women themselves. They were the ones who were actually saying that was that was really mm-hmm. fucked up, whatever. And they're the ones who left, whatever. But there was something both funny and true about the whole thing. So I really liked it. Now, I'll also be honest because we have to go along with it. Do I think that the that the, the the fledgling actress there really delivered that line from Sunset Boulevard so much better? No, I don't. But but in Sally's view, because Sally's not that good an actress, um, her thinking right. it was really good and was like, oh, of course Key she did. point. Yeah, because she's because like she's not that good an actress. Not that good a writer either, quite frankly. It's funny. I don't. This, this, this is a weird tangent, but I'm going to mention just because it's in my head right now. Um, we, I, I, we have, we have this commercials that are sometimes pop up when you're watching something uh, that you can't fast forward commercials on, and one of them is different commercials mm-hmm. for uh, Spectrum, the the cable business. And there's one yep. where there's a woman, and I think she's watching on her uh, iPhone or whatever kind of the smartphone device it is. I think she's watching like a sporting event or something. And she's like on a bus and then there's someone watching. And then everywhere she's walking, like everyone's following her everywhere until she's like at the office. And then she like, she cheers and then she get freaks out because there's like a hundred people behind her who are all been following her watching whatever. And the first time that commercial played, I was like going, is that Sally? It's not. It's not. But 
it's a very similar looking very actress much. with the same kind of hair and same kind of way. It's not the same person, but every time I see it, I still think that 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 that, that I bet that's a job that Sally could have got. <laughs> you know, because it looks like <laughs> I just keep thinking. She could have booked that gig. <laughs> I mean, I because I, I I rewatched the episode earlier this afternoon that I had something on where you have to sit through commercials, and that came on like like ten minutes after I rewatched the episode. I was like, oh, there's there's fake Sally again. <laughs> anyway. It was a dumb point, but I wanted to mention it. So whatever. Um, it stands to reason, though. There, all of all of these actors. I mean, really, in real life, they're what commercial commercial gig at best. <laughs> at best. Well, I'm not sure who we're talking. Oh, the pe- wait, 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 wait. Who are we talking about when you say that? Just so I know. Uh, all, all of all of the crew in the in the the whole little like acting crew that we have between Sally and and Barry and I mean like everyone who's being taught there. Oh, who's oh, left oh there. okay, okay. It's gotcha. not producing oh. a. It's not. It's not producing any okay, uh, okay, okay. Oscar okay. nominees. Now, now I understand. <laughs> no, no, I understand. I, I thought you were talking about the actual actors. Like, why would you say that? Stephen Root is so accomplished. How could you say such a thing? <laughs> Uh, no, no, that's that's all good. That's all fine and good. It's, I love the fact that now when you get in this episode, that Gene's little ego trip theater production, you know, the portrayal of the life and times of both himself and Barry, that incredible bit of, again, ridiculousness, <laughs> and there's no other way to go, that entire thing, what, what Gene was doing, like the little invites and, and basically making the guy... F- follow the the breadcrumbs to watch him perform this whole thing in the theater or whatever. So it was incredibly silly and ridiculous. That sets off all these dangerous dominoes. Oh, that are all tumbling. It's like, oh, everything has gone horribly, horribly wrong. And you see Barry's reaction a number of times while he's in prison. It's like, ooh, Barry angry. <laughs> you know? And that reporter mm-hmm. is going, you know, he's got... You know, who oh, oh, also oh, speaking of Mad Men, among other things he's done, you know, people, you know, everything from yes. Lost and Mad Men or whatever. I I think his role in Mad Men is probably more significant than a lot of his other ones because he was, I think Don was cheating yeah. with his wife during one entire season. He was like the annoying comedian to take off on. Um, was it Jerry Lewis? I forget. He's supposed to be a takeoff on somebody. Anyway, he's like an infection. Yes, he. Yeah, and he was also, by the way, uh, in my brain, permanently imprinted is him with that damn vulture on dinner for schmucks. Oh, God. Dinner for schmucks. <laughs> Just every time I see him, he has a vulture next to him. <laughs> Can't believe we've made a dinner for schmucks reference. Okay, well done. Um, <laughs> So I love that he's kind of like an infection everywhere. He's spreading. He's spreading this whole situation everywhere he goes. You know, I'm going to going to the prison, <laughs> and him telling Barry that sets off all that stuff. Then he goes to see Jim Moss, mm-hmm. which well, sets off stuff for himself, and also sets off something for Gene when he goes there a little bit later on. Um, the the German thing. <laughs> I, t- I love it. I'm still kind of trying to figure that out. You know what? I'm never going to figure it out. So I'm never going to question it. I'll just accept it as the gloryful, like glory filled uh, writing and silliness that it is. It's great. And then to cap off the episode. Oh, by the way, I think I mentioned, I feel like I talked about this in that last podcast, but the um, Fuchs flip flops more than any character I've ever seen, <laughs> especially on, on, on this show. No kidding. You know, you know, he hates Barry. He loves Barry. He hates Barry. He loves Barry. He's been betrayed by Barry. He wants to fight. He wants to defend Barry. He goes back and forth. how many how many switches have there been for him at this point in four seasons? Ten, twelve. It, it, it certainly feels like it. And him trying to actually save him there, which leads us to the big the, the big hit hit scene. First of all, it's it's funny that Hater got Armisen to show up. Because we know Hader and Armisen are obviously close friends who've worked together on the Documentary Now show and they're, you know, Saturday Night Live buddies. I think they've worked on other things as well. Um, they finally got a way to get him on the show in a purely insane way. <laughs> Everything, because I kept guy, thinking, why, would he, why is he making the face? <laughs> Like that, <laughs> make, it's like it's like no no. I kept thinking, I was like, wait, what do you want me to do? Like, no, just, just, just 
do like the dumbest thing possible. <laughs> it just makes no sense. He's just doing that. Whatever. That guy, he, he's there to, he's, I think he's there to kill me. You know, <laughs> he, he has a weapon. <laughs> he blows off his fingers. <laughs> And then, and it was great because then you have like, you know, you had the two feds there and the two new feds. And one of those is an actor that we've, um, people have seen on a number of other things. He was a, run, a recurring person on Veep as well, as well as other shows I've seen him on. And apparently he only gets to be on this show for about uh, 90 seconds before, before he gets his head blown off. That, that was a pure Barry scene because it's shocking and fast. And you're like, yes, whoa, and violent. It's, it's to remind, like, hey, this this show can be like really violent sometimes. We kind of forget it when we don't see anything like that for a while. Um, and then it's kind. Of, oh, by the way, okay, I I, I got to point this out. It's it's one of those things where I keep thinking, okay, did you think that from the get go, or did you come across it when you? The idea when Fuchs is watching Rain Man and he relates the two characters and that the Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman are him and Barry. By the way, Fuchs, that is not the worst uh, parallel analogy you could have come up with. I, I, I see it. I see where you're going with that. That's not, that's not bad. I want to, I, if I, if I, if, if we had Bill Hader as a guest on the podcast, <laughs> this is ridiculous. I said, so my, my curiosity is, did you know in advance that, oh, and that, 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 that little lilting kind of theme from Rain Man, which I had forgotten about until seeing the scene. I was like, oh yeah, I hadn't thought about that music in, you know, 40 years or 35 years, whatever it's been. And then they use that music for like <laughs> the episode and then it's the closing music. I was like, going, okay, so Barry's kind of Rain Man. Yeah, he's he's kind of a savant at killing. <laughs> he certainly is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know how he could have gotten out of the prison, so I'm curious to see how the next episode opens. If he if that is in fact what happens, um, I I just love stuff like that because I keep thinking, did they know that in advance, or did they just come across it? You know, just the the little things like that. And the other thing I for sometimes forget that Barry does. I think we talked about this a long time ago. I feel maybe you might have been involved in that conversation. Maybe it was one of the best of if I, or, if my, or maybe it was just in a dream. I don't remember. That we used to talk about back in the day where, you know, on the next Mad Men, and then we do a quick little clip compilation, which made no sense. <laughs> it's like, I don't know. I have no idea what this is. I have no. And on Barry, it's like, oh, it's kind of like a hold my beer there. Kind of, it's like, we're just going to do like one frame. <laughs> That will have no context, make no sense on the next barrier. <laughs> and it's just those two convicts like in the in the general just just like staring. I was like Okay. <laughs> I'm guessing they're probably staring at Fuchs unless Barry didn't get him. Because I one thing I said last week, Jamie, um I do not I do not want an entire season, especially being the final season. Of Barry in prison, that I will lose. No. I, I will mm -hmm. lose. Pa no. I will lose patience with that. Um, and the fact that you know we are going to break him out, or now he's breaking. Him out, it's like, yeah, you just need to get him out of there. I do like the fact that there's all this setup now. It's like, well, you know, if we can forget the the, the comedic side of all this, you know, Barry's Barry's got some people he wants to have a conversation with, so to speak. And by you know, he wants he wants he wants. <laughs> The, by the way, the dog catcher conversation is ridiculous. He knows. Oh my! Yeah, yeah. As if anybody listening to that isn't going to instantly know what the hell. That it's not tricky, guys. Yeah, I, it's not tricky. He, you know the phone conversations are monitored. You you must know that. <laughs> That's why people you know slip in their fucking little cell phones and shit because those all those other calls are yeah. being recorded. Whatever. The dog cat. Oh my god. But he's got an axe to grind with Gene, and we know we're going to get that scene. Mm -hmm. I don't know if mm -hmm. Jim Moss will play a part in any of this, but it certainly might. You know, I, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm. It's a show that, if you asked, can you foresee or guess how they're going to end it? It's like, I, I, I have some ideas, but 
I'm not sure. I mean, again, unlike, uh, oh, look at this full circle for our podcast. Unlike the Ms. Maisel, this is a show where I could say, well, yeah, I could see you killing him at the end. I mean, yeah, I'm not saying the they should, is. but I could see it. You know, we, we, he's had his near death, you know, afterlife like experiences already, it seems. So he's probably going to end up on that beach again at some point in this episode, in this season, I'm sure. Yeah, that weird, sa- that weird sand field he's always hanging out on. Yeah. Where they where they do it in really extreme long shots, so you can't tell like that guy doesn't look yes. like Fuchs at all. Okay, whatever. I can't really see him. So whatever. But yeah, <laughs> I, I, I really again, it's it's a it's a it's a different show than anything else. I really dig it. Um, that's why when you get if if you if you care about awards, it's a really weird situation when a show how 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 do you compare a show like this? To Ted Lasso, and then you throw in something like right. what what we do in the shadows, <laughs> you know, you have all, you know <laughs> and, and then you throw in the bear, uh, you know, which technically qualify is put under comedy. Oh, by the way, you, um, Odenkirk is joining the bear, so that's going to be amazing. Saw that, I, I, and I'm wondering, is it just going to be one episode or multiple episodes? I I didn't read the article. I was too busy going. What? I'm hoping. I am hoping that it's a. It's a little stretch, at least. But. So, if you enjoyed this podcast, guess what? You'll enjoy hanging out on our Facebook page as well. It's the Serious TV Drama Podcast page. Like the page and join the conversation about, well, pretty much any show that we talked about tonight or any other show you might want to talk about or anything else you might want to talk about in pop culture or, I don't know, anything else. Now, where can you find us? You can find us on most podcasting platforms, you know, like Apple Podcasts, where you can even rate and review us there if you're, you know, if you're in a charitable mood. Better still, you can just go to podbean.com. Type in, you can type in STVD, you can type in serious TV drama, whatever, you'll find us. You can, that way you can have access. Yeah, that's where to, I go. You can, you can access all 300 and, I forgot what number this is. I'm going to say 377. I hope that's right. 377 of our podcasts are there. Um, as I always say, I don't know, 20, 25 of them are actually good. You can follow us on the Instagram. Um, Gosh, I haven't put anything there in a while, but I probably will at some point. Maybe this weekend. I'll just put up uh, pictures for the last, like, seven podcasts. You can follow us on Instagram. <laughs> no wonder we have, like, 78 followers. It's a uh, serious TV drama as one word. And, and of course, you can also follow us on Twitter. Our handle there is at STVD Podcast. That's STVD as in serious TV drama. And because I'm a total horrible self-promoting shill... All those places, but you know, podbean.com. You can also find Scott Forgot the 80s. Remember, Scott is spelled with one T. Um, there are currently six or seven episodes. I forget. I know Red Dawn was the last one. We're going to be doing the Pretty and Pretty and Pink has been delayed a little bit, but it is going to be recorded this week. So the April podcast apparently will be coming out in May. Boohoo. But that should be a good one because I've got a lot to say about that movie. <laughs> you know, good and bad. <laughs> you know? It's one I heard about for a while and now I've watched it and I have thoughts. We will be back next week to cover. Oh, Brian will be back. Jamie, I don't know. We're gonna Yay, Brian will be back. back. She'll, she'll be back for a different podcast, I think. Um, we will be covering both this week's and the following week's episodes of Succession. So the episode that we were not able to do this week, which was the episode titled Kill List, will be covered in the next podcast. <laughs> we will have stuff to say about that. Talk about a show that is really making the most of its budget. Holy crap. And the upcoming I've episode. I heard it was a doozy. Uh I think every episode this season has been kind of a doozy. It's that right. it's that kind of a season, and uh, the next episode, which is coming this Sunday, which is I believe is titled "Living Plus" with a plus sign, whatever. Um, hey, maybe I'll be maybe some sort of streaming service like Apple Plus or Disney Plus. Uh, we'll be talking about that. We'll be talking about the next episode of Barry. Um, that's probably going to be enough because two episodes of Succession alone. <laughs> We'll take up more time than we took up on this podcast, I'm sure. Jamie, thank you so much for being able to rise to the call of duty and take over for, for Brian here. I know it's, it's been too long since you've been here, so I greatly appreciated you uh, joining the fray once again. 
Hey, thanks. I know I don't have the same chops as oh. Brian, oh, but at the end of the day, uh, I just I like talking about TV with you. So it was good to get back in the helm and chatty chat it up. Yeah. The funny thing is, I'm gonna when, when I get back into the editing and putting this episode together after we after we get off after we get off the Skype here, I just looked at them like, wait a minute, we didn't talk about Succession on this podcast, and yet it ended up being the longest one that we've done this season. What the hell? <laughs> well, you know what? I brought up like five other TV shows, so that's why. Anyway, thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you guys out there for listening, and yeah, good night, everybody. <laughs>